undercover. Unrelenting. Unforgettable. There's a suicide epidemic in America among teenagers and the elderly. But it is white adult males who are killing themselves in the most shocking numbers. These men account for two-thirds of all suicides, over 20,000 a year lost in the prime of life. Men who are husbands, fathers, athletes, businessmen, and professionals. Carmine D'Angelo was a happily married doctor living the good life, but it wasn't enough. At age 34, Carmine took a pistol and put a bullet through his brain. Cause of death, suicide. Jim Mueller, 48, corporate executive, cause of death, suicide. Nick McRae, 34, technical writer, suicide. Alex Council, real estate developer, suicide. Why are these men who seem to have the most in this society killing themselves? Only about one-third of them leave suicide notes, but those notes provide intriguing clues and warnings about the self-destructive turmoil raging in many American men. In this program, five men who committed suicide and one who survived his attempt will speak to us again through their suicide notes. This is the Kensico Dam in Valhalla, New York. And on a cold March morning in 1985, a local football hero stood on top, mumbled a prayer, and jumped. He left this note to his parents. Dear Mom and Dad, I've tried and tried and tried, and I don't see any point in this anymore. The way I led my life, I think death is deserving of me. I don't know how to handle the pain anymore. Dad, we'll see each other soon, and we'll wait for Mom. Then maybe we'll have Sunday dinner. You, me, Travis, and Mom. Ed. Ed Gallagher's life was defined by football. He brought fame to his high school team and won a football scholarship to the University of Pittsburgh. After college, when he didn't make the pros, Ed's life lost its focus, and he lost his identity. At the age of 27, he decided to end it all by leaping off the Kensico Dam. But miraculously, Ed survived. The fall left him a quadriplegic. It has also left him in a unique position to describe the suicidal despair that could make someone want to die. Just put yourself in the position of hating yourself so badly and feeling you're going to be a threat to everyone else just being alive. That you better get out of here. That you've betrayed everyone. I mean, how can you hug your mom again? How can you do anything? It would be much easier to be dead and have everybody remember me as I the football jock. That way I'll never have to tell anything about myself. Let me just die with a bang. Ed was an unlikely football hero from the beginning. He was a skinny, gawky kid with few friends. From the time I've known Ed, he was always shy. He was this big, awkward guy. I think by sixth grade, he was at least six feet tall. So he towered over all of us. So, you know, basically, you know, Ed was bigger than us, but he wasn't very coordinated. I was a real classic ectomorph, a walking stick. You know, I think at the time I was like six, three and a half, 170. Even my friends used to call me stick, and that used to drive me out of my mind. I hated being called stick. Sensitive and shy, Ed never spoke to anyone about his feelings. You would say, Ed, you know, what's wrong? Nothing. Everything's fine. 
So you didn't really know. And uh, I learned at an early age to keep my mouth closed and my ears open. And I heard whatever he wanted to say. But I never pried because he objected to that. In high school, Stick Ed Gallagher began lifting weights and caught the eye of varsity football coach Ron Berlingo. He was now 6'5", 237 pounds, and uh, his bench press was 305 pounds. I saw a big, strong guy that was going to make me a good coach <laughs> and, and who was going to be difficult to block. By his junior year, number 70, Ed Gallagher was terrorizing quarterbacks throughout the league. <laughs> Suddenly when he became the star, then I think, yeah, he became more socially acceptable. But I know kids who were, quote, the in crowd, all of a sudden Ed, you know, was somebody that they recognized. My husband and I went to all the games. He had all the answers, you know, shouting, you should have done this, you should have done that, shouting in the stand. Typical father. Oh. I love the physical contact of football, hitting quarterbacks, knocking people on their ass. But I did enjoy it. I liked it. Football could have been a cover-up also for other things that were going on in my head. Uh, from like 14 on, I said, you know, problems with, uh, hey, who am I, what am I, sex and different things, and sexual confusion of all kinds, you know. And when I say sexual confusion, I had gay and straight fantasies, okay? But I said, no, I got to be a football player, and I got to cut myself in that mold. And I thought anything gay, you know, any gay fantasies, no, 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 any sensitivity of any kind, writing poems, or anything, oh, no, 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 be John Wayne, be uh, whoever, Joe Macho, and be in that category, or else, because if you drift away, you're a wimp, you're a wimp, you're a wimp. His senior year, Ed led his team to their first league championship in 13 years. And the way Ed was voted all county, all state, and most valuable lineman in the league, college recruiters flocked to see him. Ed went to the University of Pittsburgh on a full scholarship, and by his junior year had won the starting position at offensive guard. But his senior year, Ed was sidelined with a leg injury. After graduation, he tried out for the New York Jets, but he was cut after two weeks. It was almost a relief in many ways at the time, because I said, oh good, I'm finally out of this damn football. I, I told myself, oh, you're going to live a whole new life now. You're going to do different things. You're going to do things you never dared to do. But Ed didn't know how to escape his muscle-bound image. Although he had a college degree, he kept choosing jobs that emphasized his brawn over his brain, first as a bouncer at a bar, then as a furniture mover. Ed was an excellent employee. He was honest. He was reliable. He was conscientious of the job he was doing. He got along very well with the other employees and with the customers. As I got to know him, I think I was able to see uh, a moodiness there at times. I don't think there, were, there wasn't a particular time that he began to get moody. I think he was always moody. I, I never could get too close to anyone talk about my real feelings. Are you kidding? My poor dog was a great psychologist. He's the only one I confided to. He heard everything. It felt so good just to say something. Hey, Travis, Travis was his name. You still love me even though I said that, buddy? Now, it sounds funny, but it's also kind of pathetic. That's how bad I wanted to talk. If something just hit me the wrong way, I would let loose. Just, who the hell do you think you are? Screw off, man. Many, many times it was displaced aggression because I hated so many things about myself. 
that it would just come out onto you. Ed's secret release was his poetry. Since college, he'd been writing poems, many of them filled with angry imagery and questions about death and dying. Longing to escape his athlete's identity at home, Ed joined a songwriting class in New York City. I was getting accustomed to New York City a bit, you know, with the songwriting class and different things. I liked it. Hey, this is different than Westchester. This is nice. Hi, oh, there's all kinds of people here, and isn't this great? I started looking at myself, said, hey, maybe you can get in touch with a few of the other things that you've always repressed and never, never exposed or shared with anyone. Again, because you always tried to be Joe Jock, OK? So what happened was, in early 1985, and, <laughs> and believe me, I've certainly come a long way to talk about this, because there's a lot of things that go into suicide itself, but one thing usually triggers it. I never thought at any time would I ever, ever, ever say this out loud, let, let alone on national television. But it was in early 85, so I hope that proves progress. Early 85, I went way down Greenwich Village. I went to a restaurant by myself, got tanked up on some wine, and then just went around uh, cruising here and there, you know? And it was like, uh, I don't know, man. Are there people that have sex hangups and stuff? Are there people like me here? Do I want to talk with them? Do I want to do that? Not really, but yes. Not really, but yes. And what came down was finally, after all the years of repression and different things, I finally made fantasy become a reality, and I kind of got coaxed into my first gay fling. I said, oh, you know, it was fine. Everything was cool. But it was like when sobriety hit me the next day, what did you do, you son of a bitch? You filthy son of a bitch, what did you do? I was a disgrace to myself, to my parents, to my friends. I betrayed myself, I betrayed everyone. I didn't know how to, how to, how to undo what I did. I mean, there were nights where it was, it was only like 12 days before I, uh, before I attempted my suicide attempt that this happened. It's like I would go to bed at night and everything was struggling inside, twisting and turning. It was finally like ice that I couldn't breathe through. And I'd wake up at 4 in the morning and I'd look in the mirror and I'd see my eyes flashing like wild, like it could kill, like it could do something. I said, you got to get out of here, man. You got to do something now. Well, you're only moving furniture right now. You're not doing well enough. What the hell? You better move your ass anyway. You know, you're not making much of a mark in this life. Do it, 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 do it. He looked troubled. He looked very, um, a little depressed and a little disturbed and upset. And my immediate reaction was, well, is there something uh, to do with his job that he might be upset about? Is he mad at me for some reason? And, um... He didn't want to discuss it. So I thought that in a few days he would, uh, I'd be back in touch with him and we'd find out what was wrong. When Ed awoke on March 1st, he was filled with a self loathing he could not endure. Feeling trapped and tormented, he drove to the top of the nearby Kensico Dam. Two miles from where I made all county, all state football, everything in. In a way, that's where it all began, with the football stuff and that. And this is where it's all going to end. I got on top. And I said, God, forgive me, and I rolled off. And I hit once. And I hit twice. And then I hit it down another 40 feet or so. 
broke my left wrist, my right ankle, and my neck at the cervical sixth and seventh levels. So I'm paralyzed from the chest down. When Ed regained consciousness in the hospital, he was immobilized with a tracheotomy that left him unable to speak for three months. Nurses, doctors who came around me try to help me. I punched them. I literally punched them if I could. I wanted them to hate me so bad, great. If I could be the biggest prick in the world, that was great, because if they'd hate me, they'd leave me alone to die. I feel a person's life is mapped out from the moment they're born. And regardless of what happens, nothing could change it. So I've never felt that there was anything maybe I should have done or my husband should have done that might have prevented this. Because uh, I, ju I just, that's how I feel about it. All I did all day and night was look up at the ceiling. Screw you, God. Screw you, devil. Screw you, everything and everyone. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. This is the worst hell I can imagine. Try to kill myself and I screw that up as well as anything else. For six months, Ed held on to his angry death wish. But something changed when doctors told him an infection in his heel might require the amputation of his leg. I said, when I was alone with myself, holy Christ. Hey, I don't know if you're there, God. I'm paralyzed and I'm pissed and I made a hell of a mistake, but I don't want to lose my leg. Doctors operated, but they only had to remove a small part of Ed's heel. And I think that all of a sudden that gave me a jolt. Maybe there's someone there, somebody up there likes me, that type of thing. Maybe someone or something's listening to me. Let me try to make something of this second chance. If I don't learn from a second chance, what the hell good is it? Ed Gallagher is one of the few who will get a second chance. Most suicide attempts by American men are fatal. And though the trigger for each may be different, when we look into their lives, we can see similar patterns of despair. Suicidal depression can be set off by traumatic life events, such as the loss of a job or a loved one. But though they suffer, many men refuse to get help, regarding it as a sign of weakness. Dr. Carmine D'Angelo believed he could take care of himself. He was the first in his family to graduate from college. He graduated cum laude, got married, and went on to become a successful Los Angeles dentist. The only explanation for his suicide at age 34 was this note to his wife. Dear Bay Bay, I'm sorry I had to leave you this way. I had no desire to continue living with all the problems that were inside my head. When he died, Carmine and Marianne had been married for 10 years. Carmine was a very gorgeous guy. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He was a lot of fun. He'd always crack jokes, and we just had a really good time together. But suddenly, after his father died of cancer, Carmine became withdrawn and angry, unnecessarily blaming himself for his father's death. He would come home and then brood about it. You know, after all his father did for him, he should have been there for his father, and he's the doctor, and he should have known. Carmine was very depressed. Um, he didn't show it to anyone but me. He was lethargic, um, had no interest in doing anything, started going on and on about his problems or things that were on his mind that I couldn't really understand. Um, and he didn't want to go for help. I had no interest in seeing a psychiatrist because I would only end up the same way. It was not fair that I put you through a lot of grief. 
You've had a lot of patience with me and tried your best to help. He was aware that he was depressed. I think that as a dentist, he felt that um, since being in the health profession, people look up to him and look to him to solve their problems and their pain and, and everything. He thought that he should be able to solve his own problems, and he didn't want to go to anyone else. Nothing Marianne could do seemed to bring him out of his depression. On October 31st, 1989, Carmine drove to Las Vegas, rented a room, and shot himself in the head. You're young, beautiful, intelligent, and you deserve someone who has all his marbles together. I love you, and I'm sorry. Say goodbye to your mom and Spicio for me. Love, Carmine. No one who hasn't gone through this can possibly know the intensity of the pain. And I think that if he had known the kind of pain I was going to be going through, I mean, I'm just saying I think he wouldn't have done it. I don't know. More and more highly driven men suffer from what psychiatrists call encore anxiety, the fear that they cannot repeat their previous successes. Some will choose death rather than live in dread of decline. Before he shot himself at age 48, Jim Mueller was the model of success and stability. He grew up in Iowa, married his childhood sweetheart, became a CPA and shot to the top of the corporate world. He loved parties and travel, and was always the first to pick up the tab. Jim was tall, athletic, quite flamboyant, I would say. He liked to be uh, the life of the party. He wanted people to look at him and say uh, he was successful, that uh, he could uh, do things, uh, important things for other people, and have some of the nice things in life. Jim grew up poor and married rich. All his life, he worked hard and measured his achievements in terms of financial success. I think that Jim had the idea that uh, he had to be very successful to take care of me and our children the uh, way that my father had taken care of me. Dear Dee Dee, first of all, I love you enough to make the supreme sacrifice for you. My reasons for doing so are as follows professional. Between John and Joe, I did everything in my power and skill to make them money and save taxes. I have to undergo the constant pressure from auditors and it's more than I can stand. I just don't have the energy to start over. This was the second time that uh, a business deal uh, had fallen through. The first time had been about four years before. We lost a lot on that. But we came through it, so I thought that everything was fine because we had worked it out and become very uh, good friends as well as husband and wife. Um, I thought that we could work out everything. Tell Christy I, I love her dearly and hope for a happier life than I have had. Tell my mother and your family that I love all of them. I didn't want to mess up the house, so I'm back by the canoe. All my love, Jim. Many American men have an all or nothing outlook on life. Either they are good providers or they are worthless. For over 20 years, Alex Council was an excellent provider for his wife and four children. He was a real estate developer and before that a successful mortgage banker. He was a highly principled man. So when the IRS questioned one of his tax deductions, he assumed it could be quickly solved, but it wasn't. The dispute grew to a four-year battle that drained his finances and his spirit. Unable to make a living, at age 49, Alex walked into the woods near his house and shot himself. My dearest Kay, I have taken my life in order to provide capital for you. 
The decision was one that I think he made months before he actually committed suicide in case things ever got to a certain point. And I think in his mind, he never thought that it would. Alex was the eternal optimist, which um, is hard to understand. The IRS and its liens, which have been taken against our property illegally by a runaway agency of our government, have dried up all sources of credit for us. So I've made the only decision I can. It's purely a business decision. I hope you can understand that. I can deal with Alex's decision as a business decision. And that's what I did for two and a half years. Because that's what I had to do to survive. Since time is of the essence in all money transactions, I request that you obtain the required evidence of death from the authorities and present them to Saver's life. The policy benefits are payable to you immediately. Alex left Kay 15 pages of instructions on how to use the insurance money to fight the IRS and how to save his now failing business. Kay pressed the case in court and won against the IRS. Alex was completely exonerated six months after his suicide. I guess in the last six months, I've been able to say, how dare you do this to me? How dare you leave me and give me this list of all these things to do and expect me to accomplish it? How dare you think that I would survive your death? <laughs>